All right, so looks like we are live. Put that there. Let's go live on Instagram. test this out I've never done this before so hello hello folks okay so um, what's up TFC community uh, thank you for tuning in I hope uh, this little session is of value to you and hopefully helps to clarify a few things um, I think we're you know I hope you're all doing well coping with the the weird times we're living in right now uh, it's definitely a strange time. I live in Ontario, Canada, and they just de declared a state of emergency. So things are getting a little bit serious, and um, you know there's still a lot of uncertainty. But today is all about looking on the positive side, and you know the only way I know how to contribute in a positive way is by sharing information uh, that might help people. So here we go. If you enjoy it, great. I'll do more of them. Uh, if this is a waste of time, then I won't do as many of them. So thanks everyone for tuning in. So uh, we're gonna be chatting for the next 20 minutes and then at the end I'll do 10 minutes of like Q&A. So if you have a topic or a question that's relevant um, and I can give any valuable input on, uh, I will. So we'll open that up after. But the agenda for today is we're gonna talk about feet for about five minutes. Um, so I'm gonna condense it as much as I can. And actually it's really simple. So I think we'll be able to cover enough in five minutes that hopefully gives you a basic understanding of how to have healthy functional feet because it's actually really simple feet are complex but having healthy feet super simple so we'll cover that we're gonna talk for five minutes about fear immunity and what that even means you know what fear is um, we'll just kind of unpack that a little bit I've been playing around with it in my brain a little bit uh, and then we're gonna talk for 10 minutes about sleep because I think sleep uh, sleep is important and it's so underrated and you know our team has been researching sleep for about a year now um, and we've been including it in our in our new seminar so we'll want to talk about sleep especially at a time like this where you know sleep is a massive um, has a massive effect on your immune function so that's relevant now but in general you know if people are at home why not learn about something you're going to do every single day that can have the single maybe the biggest impact on your health uh, if you clean up some sleep habits so what's up everyone um, okay so let's talk about feet we're gonna go real simple with this today okay so really when it comes to information I think less is more when it comes to um, footwear less is more as well and you know I think what we learned and what we've learned by covering feet so far is that um, the more complexity and the more information you give people, the more confusion it creates. And by keeping things really, really simple, you create clarity, which then facilitates action. So today is all about clarity. If you want healthy feet, and what does healthy feet even mean? I think healthy feet means feet that are pain-free, that are strong, and that are resilient. So that if something happens to them, they can recover fairly quickly. Um, just use your feet as they were designed. That's literally it. You want healthy feet, use them as we were, as our feet were adapted to be used. And what does that mean? Uh, it means exposing them to a, a big variety of textures and surfaces. And it also means when you wear protection for your feet, which is what we call footwear, um, wear footwear that doesn't inhibit the natural function of your feet. That's it, Those are the, there's no secrets, right? Wear shoes that don't mess your feet up and use your feet as nature intended, okay? So it doesn't matter what state your feet are in, Okay, you might have super gnarly feet, you might have plantar fasciitis, bunions, all this kind of stuff. But if you spend time barefoot when able, and I think if people are gonna be, you know, quote unquote, in isolation, if they're gonna be at home, um, it's a great opportunity to go barefoot, right? Like, <laughs> I always love when people are like, how can you go barefoot outside? There's needles, there's rocks, there's glass. Yeah, I, I don't cut my feet and actually it's very rare to see those things, but in your house, you have complete control over what kind of, you know, if your house is littered with needles and glass, you got bigger shit to work on than your feet, right? So controlled environment, 
spend time barefoot in the house, uh, do your own barefoot experiment, right? And what does that even mean? Well, you try going barefoot for five minutes and then you be honest with yourself and think, how do I feel? Do your feet feel good? Do they feel sore? Where do they feel sore? How long does it take for them to get sore? Like really think of, you know, just tune into your body is really it, right? If it hurts, do less. If it doesn't, do more. That's it. Um, and when it comes to footwear, the mnemonic to remember is WTFF. Make that mean whatever you want. What the fuck footwear is a good one to remember, okay? And what, is that, what do those things mean? Well, the W is wide. So the widest part of your foot kind of looks like your hand, right? The widest part of your foot is actually the tip of your toes. So the widest part of a shoe um, should be the tip of the toes, which means it's very hard to find footwear that's shaped like feet, but you can do your best to do that. Um, that's the biggest reason we created tfcshop.com is to just provide footwear that, um, provide a place where people don't have to ask whether the footwear is good for their feet or not. Um, just know that everything that's there is, is what we consider to be natural foot health or natural footwear and healthy for your feet. Um, but the W is wide, wide enough that when you put your foot in the shoe, it's not going to compress it. Okay, that's where you start getting bunions created. And if the widest part of your foot is the tip of your toes, well, wearing a shoe that comes tapers into a point and goes in like a triangle doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In fact, if you wear shoes like that, which is 99% of shoes, most running shoes, almost every dress shoe goes into a point and if you wear shoes like that and you don't get bunions, it's weird. It's not weird that you get bunions, it's weird that you don't understand why you get bunions if you jam your foot into a triangle. Okay, sorry if that's harsh, but um, yeah. So why, W is wide, T is thin. The thinner the sole, the better. Your foot is a sensor, it needs to be able to feel the ground. If it can't, um, then your brain can't get the right input in order to guide it to move well, okay? So T is thin, as thin of a sole as you can while still being able to protect your foot from any potential dangers from the environment. Okay, F is flat. Uh, the first F is flat. We're not supposed to stand on ramps, so wear a flat shoe um, that is no higher at the heel than it is at the forefoot, right? The only reason to wear a shoe with an elevated heel is if you're a cowboy and you're wearing cowboy boots and you need something to keep you in the stirrup. That's it, there's no other reason, right? High, people talk about high heels in, in the context of women's stiletto, but um, you know, running shoes are high heels. And we got a podcast coming out, I did a solo cast talking about the cost of cushioning with running. And we talk about um, you know, why companies wedge all this cushioning at the heel, but wear a shoe that's flat. Okay, when you're standing on a ramp, it affects the alignment of your joints, it affects your brain's perception of neutral at the ankle, and all those things can really have a negative impact. Okay, so F is flat, and then the last F is flexible. In each of your feet, you have 26 bones and 33 joints. Joints are adapted into the human body because there's supposed to be movement at that uh, location on the body, right? I have an elbow joint so I can feed myself and throw things. Uh, I don't have a joint in the middle of my forearm because I don't need to bend there. And if you have 33 joints in each foot, that tells you that there's supposed to be a huge amount of movement at your feet. And if you wear a shoe that you can't bend, twist, curl, uh, if you wear a stiff shoe, your foot will eventually become stiff because the shoe is your foot's environment that it's exposed to. And when your feet get stiff, they get weak and they typically become painful. So a good way to bump out of that, um, that kind of, you know, that bad place of, of having stiff, weak, painful feet is just to wear shoes that are flexible. So WTFF, wide, thin, flat, flexible, that's it. Um, someone just said, which running shoes do you recommend? It's pretty, it's kind of interesting because any shoe that is good for your foot, you can run in. There's no such thing as a running shoe, right? There are shoes that you can use for running um, and there's some features like being lightweight or being uh, made with breathable materials, but um, you don't need a running shoe. You just need a shoe that's good for your foot and then you can run in it, right? Any shoe that I have in my cupboard, I can run in, including sandals, including uh, you know a Vivo Barefoot quote unquote dress shoe because if it's good for your foot, it's good enough to run in. Um, and most quote unquote running shoes that are loaded with cushioning are actually really terrible to run in and they affect the way you move so um, squat game is strong I'm actually using a beam right now as a perch because you know being in a squat for a long period of time um, with uh, with my feet flat on the floor is has gotten significantly more comfortable uh, but sometimes it's nice to have a straighter spine by just having a beam under your feet so I am kind of cheating a little bit with my heels above the ground which is fine all right 
so that's it with feet. Wear healthy shoes, use your feet as, as essentially they've been adapted to be used and big surprise, your feet will be healthy. They'll be strong, they'll be pain-free, they'll be resilient um, and just do your own barefoot experiment, right? Tune into your body, if it hurts, back off. If it feels fine, do more. That's it, really simple. Next one we're gonna talk about is fear immunity. So, um, you know, Fear is defined as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something is dangerous, likely to cause pain, or is a threat. So fear is a stressor. It puts us in fight or flight mode. Um, you know, and fear is, fear is adaptive. We're supposed to have fear, right? When a, if you're being chased by a tiger, having fear is good because it essentially promotes adaptive behavior, which is running away from the tiger so you don't get eaten. That's good. Um, Unfortunately, when it comes to being scared and stressing about a situation that lasts for a long period of time, like the one we're currently in, fear becomes maladaptive and actually depletes your health and depletes your energy. It reduces your immune function. It can affect your sleep. So fear is not adaptive when it's carried over for long for long term. <laughs> Glad you're liking the info kinetics movement. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I mean, I know your time is precious. I don't wanna waste it. I did a little bit of prep, but hopefully this stuff gives you some value and I'm actually recording this. And I'm gonna fire it up on YouTube if you wanna to listen to it again. Um, or for other people to listen to. So when it comes to being scared or having fear long-term, it's not adaptive, right? And so right now we're in a scary situation. There's lots of uncertainty, but I think a lot of people, you know, I think a lot of people probably feel helpless, which is understandable, but I think, you know, here's my take. If you take action, you can create an immunity against fear. And at a time like now, being healthy and being positive is exactly what we need. Um, being scared uh, and confused is not what we need. So taking action is the biggest thing you can do to reduce fear. And I think taking action comes in two parts. Number one is be informed. Uncertainty is scary. If you don't know what's going on, if you don't know what's happening in the world, it can be scary. Um, but if you become informed, and there's also a little bit of a slippery slope there because you know, if you look at mainstream media, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of bullshit. Um, there's also, you know, if you talk to friends, there's a lot of gossip. They hear something from Facebook and before you know it, it goes through 10 people's mouths and now some, it's talking about some crazy shit that's not accurate. So, be in, it, we, you know, we created the COVID-19 info page at thefootcollective.com to hopefully distill away the most relevant information and then block out all the crap, right? Because you don't need to know everything about this. You just need to know what you need to know to feel safe and to feel like you have an awareness of um, of what you need to do to stay out of harm's way, right? So be be minimally informed, um, so that you can understand what you need to do. Um, and I think taking action also revolves around changing your behaviors, right? So avoid being obsessing over the news, um, but focus on what you can change. And something that we can all change is our, our actions, right? So being healthy is your biggest defense against um, lowered immune function. Okay, and if there's anything that any positive that comes from this, uh, it's that if we're all stuck in our homes, well, you have complete control over your home um, and the behaviors you do. So you have control over what you eat, over how and when you sleep, over whether you're moving or not, over what media you're consuming. So put all these things to the test and really evaluate: Are you doing things to improve your health or to the detriment of your health? Okay, and same thing with your family. So ways that you can take action. Uh, call your family members and connect with them and make a pact to not talk about shitty things, right? So basically say, you know, call your family up and say, let's talk about positive things because there's a lot of positive shit going on in the world. There's a lot of positive shit in people's lives. As bad as things are, you can always find good things to talk about. Um, so call your family up, connect with them, um, talk about positive things, um, ensure that you're eating nourishing real food, Right, like not just eating things, uh, eating real nourishing food, things that are gonna give your body nutrients and not take away from your body's energy, right? The comparison we always make in our seminar um, is, 
comparing a loaf of Wonder Bread to a loaf of homemade sourdough. So Wonder Bread has 41 ingredients. They call it bread, but it's really just uh, this kind of Franken food that we create in, in massive factories. It has 41 ingredients. It contains, the third ingredient on the list is a form of sugar. I think it's actually sugar. And then later on, they also list high fructose corn syrup and uh, I believe sucrose. So three kinds of sugar, a bunch of ingredients you can't pronounce that should be in a chem chemistry lab. 41 ingredients total um, versus fresh sourdough, right? Fresh loaf of sourdough that was just baked by a human uh, has four ingredients, salt, flour, water, and yeast. That's it. That's real bread versus Wonder Bread is not really real bread. Um, so that's what I mean when I say eat nourishing real food, okay? The, now you just have to inform yourself about what real food actually is. Um, so eat nourishing food, move every day, go outside for a walk. Right, like movement is very, very important for health. So make sure you're moving every day, drink lots of, drink water. I wouldn't say lots of water, don't get crazy with it, but make sure you're drinking enough water. Um, I don't know what enough is, you know, just stay hydrated in general. I drink a big bottle of water in the morning. I fill a 40 ounce bottle of water three to four times in a day. That's enough for me. Um, and so figure out what enough means for you, but it's not incessantly drinking water. Um, a lot of times eating fruits that can, that can retain a lot of moisture. Uh, so things like chia seeds or, um, you know, fruits like apples, um, peaches, you know, there's a lot of water in those and they actually get, get slow release instead of just crushing bottles of water. So, um, you know, immunity is a state of resistance and in order to become immune to fear, you have to, um, you know, be able to, to do things that essentially make you feel at ease. So find, you know, in terms of movement, moving a lot during the day, find things that make you happy, right? Dance around your house, um, balance on a beam, you know, do some squats with family members, do fun movements. It has to be fun. Bring your, do something to bring yourself joy. Um, and one of the other behaviors is sleep. So let's talk a little bit about sleep and I'm gonna change my position. Key is variety. So just switch positions frequently and you'll be fine. So let's talk about sleep. Sleep is like a magic bullet for health, okay? It's available for all of us every single night. Most of us choose not to tap into it, even though it's essentially this miracle thing that's available to everyone. Um, general stuff about sleep, every creature sleeps, it's essential. Uh, if you don't sleep, you literally die. That's why they took um, they took longest time without sleeping out of the Guinness Book of World Records because people were literally dying trying to make attempts at the record. So if you don't sleep, you literally die. It's very important. You know, the fact that every creature sleep shows you that if sleep wasn't absolutely essential and didn't serve really powerful purposes, uh, we wouldn't do it, right? Like why would we essentially go unconscious for eight hours a day, not being able to defend ourselves, get food or protect our young if it wasn't absolutely essential? It's essential, it's very important, so prioritize it. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of benefits. I'm not just gonna rag on about benefits of sleep. There's tons of them, emotional, physical, um, mental benefits. A couple of ones to note, it boosts immune function, which is a big deal right now. The stronger your body is in terms of being able to fight things off, the better you're gonna be able to handle um, an infection like a virus if you do come across it. And I think the trend right now is the fact that we're not gonna be able to prevent this virus from spreading. Um, but we can do our best to prepare our bodies to fight it when that time comes. And um, it's not deadly for everyone. It's, it's very dangerous for certain populations, um, but everyone should just be focusing on their health and the healthier you can be, the better you can deal with shit um, if it gets thrown your way. So that's, that's something you have full control over. And I think a big thing with reducing, improving your mindset is changing the things you have control over and happily accepting and, and essentially forgetting about the things that you can't change. Change, right? You can't change what happens in the world, but you can change what you're doing uh, to react or to respond to what's happening in the world. And that's what, really what we need to focus on. So uh, it improves sleep and pew, improves emotional regulation and cognitive function, which are both really important uh, all the time, but also right now. And it also regulates appetite. So if you're stuck in your house um, and you're sleep deprived, you're probably going to eat not necessarily when you're hungry, but just when you're bored because your sleep regulation hormones get thrown out of whack when you're sleep deprived. Um, and you typically reach for the shittier foods, the ones that are high in sugar, high in calories, but low in nutrients. So if you prioritize sleep, you tend to not reach for those foods as much and only eat when you're hungry instead of just um, eating haphazardly. 
Okay, so sleep is important for that stuff. Now, let's talk about the most important part with sleep. Um, and I don't want to put everyone to sleep talking about sleep, so I'm not going to talk about it for a huge amount longer. But most importantly, let's talk about obstacles to sleep, right? People know, you know, anyone that's out there and says, okay, sleep is important, I want to prioritize it. Well, let's actually give some actionable stuff that you can do. Okay, so what are the big obstacles that we face today with sleep? And how do you circumvent them so that you can um, essentially overstep the obstacles? and then get closer to having optimal sleep. Number one is a sleep opportunity. What does that mean? Well, in order to get enough sleep, you have to be in bed with the lights out for enough time. And if you're only in bed for six hours a night, you're not gonna be able to get optimal sleep if that means seven, eight hours. Okay, so be in bed for eight hours every single night and at least give, your chance to, give yourself a chance to get enough sleep. So that's sleep opportunity. If you're not in bed for enough time, you cannot get enough sleep, okay? Second one is screens. Screens are these weird things that weaseled their way into our lives, whether it's our phones or laptop or tablet or TV. Um, the thing with screens is that they essentially trick our brains into thinking it's daylight. Even if it's midnight, if we're looking at a screen, you're basically sending your brain the signal that it's daytime, be awake, don't be asleep. Um, and so a really easy way to get around that is a screen curfew, right? So if I know I'm gonna be waking up at 6 a.m., Backtrack eight hours, that's 10 p.m. If you subtract another hour and start with whatever you're prepared to start with that you're actually gonna do, right? If you are the kind of person that looks at their phone until the last second before they fall asleep, maybe starting with 20 minutes without your phone before bed is a good place to start, right? I think an hour, two hours would probably be even better based on the research of um, how much screen time inhibits melatonin and messes with your ability to get to sleep. So let's just say an hour. So an hour before you go to sleep before lights out, um, make a curfew for yourself so that there's no screens. Very simple. And just see how that makes you feel in the morning. If it makes you feel more energized or more um, awake and refreshed, then maybe that helped your sleep, right? Do your own sleep experiment. So screens, create a curfew. It, that's a powerful one. It was very powerful for me. Um, remove screens from the bedroom, right? Make the bedroom a screen-free zone and be in, in the bedroom an hour before you actually fall asleep and a lot of good shit happens, right? Engineer the environment and the right behaviors just happen. Uh, another one is drugs. And I'm, I'm not talking about the illicit ones. I'm talking about the really powerful ones that stop our sleep. The biggest one of which is caffeine. Okay, caffeine. Coffee is the second most traded commodity on planet Earth, second only to oil, which shows you how many people are sleep deprived because they're looking for something to make them feel a bit of a boost. Um, caffeine is a half-life of about seven hours. Half-life is essentially the amount of time it takes for your body to clear half of that substance from your system. Okay, so when, when I say caffeine is a half-life of seven hours, that means that if I have a large cup of coffee at noon, by 7 p.m., half of the caffeine that I consumed is still in my system. Okay, that's a long-ass half-life. And uh, I won't get into the mechanism of caffeine, but it essentially competes with something called adenosine, um, or I guess I will get into it, because you have to know context in order to understand the why. So one of the mechanisms that regulates our sleep is called sleep pressure. It's a chemical called adenosine that basically cycles around in our body and the more hours you're awake for, the more adenosine you have trickling into your system. Okay, and a lot of adenosine in your system will make you feel sleepy, tired, right, drowsy. Um, and so that's why if you're up for a long period of time, you tend to feel really drowsy. Caffeine competes with adenosine. So if you have a shitload of adenosine in your system, you drink a cup of coffee, um, you'll immediately block away some of the effects of that adenosine. Now where does that come into play in the morning? Well, if you had a suboptimal sleep, you instead of, and every single night, sorry, I should add this, every single night adenosine gets cleared from your system if you get optimal sleep. So if you didn't get an optimal sleep, you'll still have adenosine in your system in the morning. You'll still feel a bit groggy and drowsy. Drink a cup of coffee, caffeine competes with adenosine, makes you feel a bit of a boost because the adenosine isn't having as big of an effect. Okay, long half-life, easy way to solve the caffeine problem, create a caffeine curfew. I have my last coffee by 11 a.m. every day. If I go beyond that, I find it makes it hard for me to get to sleep. It's different for every person. Do your own experiment. Have your, if you usually have your last coffee at three, have it at one then have it at 11. Write down, how did I sleep? How did I feel the next morning when I woke up? Do your own experiment, record things, um, and just figure out what works best for you. Okay, people are sensitive to caffeine in different ways, but you never know unless you try. Okay, um, lack of movement's another big one. Okay.
okay? So movement is actually what generates adenosine. Adenosine is a byproduct of ATP use. So um, if you don't move a lot during the day, you essentially go to sleep at night with a full battery and um, it can be hard to get to sleep. So make sure you're getting, if you sit all day at a desk, it's gonna be really hard to get to sleep at night because you haven't earned your sleep, right? You haven't emptied your battery so that you're actually physically tired. So especially now, if people are gonna be cooped up in their houses, get out and move, do movement in your house, right? It can be anything. Literally go up and down your stairs 20 times. Um, just get the movement in, it'll make sleep at the end of the day much easier and if you're sleeping well you're gonna have a good immune system um, a lot of good things happen okay so uh, lack of movement and then a busy mind so if your mind is racing thinking about things that you don't want to be thinking of but can't help but think of um, maybe you need some sort of mental training practice to improve the ability to control your mind right to improve your ability to settle down thoughts um, at a time like bedtime when you're supposed to be sleeping instead of solving problems okay so that can be a meditation practice it can be uh, beam work it can be breath work whatever it is do something to improve your ability to control your mind it makes a massive massive difference. Um, journaling before I went to bed, and journaling just means write shit down. Whatever you're thinking of that's keeping you awake in bed, write it down, clear it from your system, and it essentially gives you permission to sleep. And for me, that was a big one. So try it out, see how it goes. Um, two more things I wanna talk about. Number one is what I call a sleep sanctuary. So this is just about engineering your environment, your bedroom, to be really, really conducive to sleep, okay? What are elements of a good sleep sanctuary? Well, you got cold, so 18 degrees Celsius or just a cool place right if it's hot it's hard to get to sleep uh, dark so get a good pair of blackout get a good set of blackout blinds block out light pollution um, make sure there's no screens in the bedroom that's a powerful one um, and then the third one is have it be a place reserved for sleep and sex right you have to train your brain that when you walk into your bedroom you're either there to sleep or to have sex and then sleep so make it a place reserved for those things don't work in the bedroom don't watch TV don't look at your phone in the bedroom have have it be like a dojo. When you walk into that space, your, your brain should be trained that that is a place for sleep. Um, you know, we do this with kids all the time. We do these pre-sleep rituals or make sure the bedroom is good for them to be able to sleep in, but we don't take our own advice as adults and it's very, very powerful, okay? So sleep sanctuary, uh, dark, cool, and a place reserved for sleep uh, and sex, okay? Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk about with sleep is enough sleep. Okay, what does enough sleep even mean? Because it's not a certain number. It's not a number that is set for everyone or even set for people um, all the time, right? From day to day and from person to person, the number that qualifies as enough sleep is gonna be different. Um, and we feel that the best way to describe enough sleep is essentially waking up refreshed without an alarm clock and without having any coffee. Right, so you gotta figure out what enough sleep means. If, you can't, if you're not waking up refreshed and energized without needing a coffee or without needing to smack an alarm clock to get you out of bed, you're probably not getting enough sleep. What is enough sleep? Well, you gotta determine that yourself. So optimize the environment. A good sleep starts the day before, um, essentially by engineering your pre-sleep ritual, making sure that you haven't had caffeine past a certain deadline, not looking at screens right before bed, right? There's so many factors and variables that are just part of our everyday life that are obstacles to sleep. And if you have an awareness of them, then you can protect yourself from them. If you don't know looking at your screen for three hours before bed is stopping you from sleeping, how are you ever gonna fix the problem, right? So it starts with awareness and then you gotta take action. So pick one thing that you think uh, you can improve and just start tonight, right? Every single night you sleep, every night you have an opportunity to run a new experiment and see what the result is. So just do your experiments and see what works for you. Powerful stuff. So I hope unpacking those topics helped a bit, right? We talked about um, feet, just real nice and quick. Uh, we talked about um, you know foot health and footwear. We talked about immunity from fear and what that even means. And then we talked a little bit about sleep um, and how sleep can be a powerful element, is a hugely powerful element for health, um, but especially for, um, you know at times like this, immune function, mood regulation, appetite regulation, it's all really important stuff. So. That's about, we went a bit over, we did about 30 minutes. We're gonna talk about, we're just gonna do some Q&A. So I'm gonna bring this thing a little bit closer and 
and I am going to answer any questions that I can give constructive input on or that are relevant. So if anyone has questions, um, feel free to fire them over. Arthritis and metatarsals. That's not really a question. Arthritis just means joint irritation, by the way. So, itis, inflammation, irritation, arthro, joint, your joints are irritated. It's not about, um, you know, when it comes to joint arthritis, figure out what's causing the irritation of the joints. Usually it has to do, any, any problems with feet, like the number one thing you should be looking at is your footwear, that's it. What to do about it? Um, that's a that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many variables that can go into it. Make sure the joints are moving on a regular basis. If you're wearing shoes that don't allow your foot to move, you're not going to get any motion at the metatarsals or at the at the joints, I guess. Um, and then the joint surfaces can degrade. So movement is your friend. Move your feet. Wear footwear that allow natural movement, and um, hopefully it'll reduce the likelihood.